Praise the Lord. Uh, I know you can't unmute yourself. Could you just wave and give Jesus a hand and just appreciate him for his goodness? Hallelujah. I bring you greetings from Dallas, Texas, where God lives. Uh, <laughs> yes, where uh, uh, God rules. I thank God. And guess what? God, God rules Belgium and God lives in Belgium because you are there. I need to understand that. Um, anywhere you are, God is. Amen. God is everywhere, but it doesn't show up everywhere. But anywhere you are, God has shown up. Hallelujah. Can we say a word of prayer together? A happy convention to you, first of all. I want to thank my dear friend and brother, uh, Pastor himself, my dear sister, Boma. The Wannibos have been a wonderful couple. Um, we've been on the journey together. And my prayer is that we will finish this race well. We will finish together. And in heaven, we'll be able to discuss how we overcame by and by. In Jesus' mighty name. Hallelujah. Nice to see you all. You, you all look. We can't hear you, sir. We can't hear you, sir. You're, I think you've either muted yourself or so. Again. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yes. yes. Praise the Lord. I think, you know, we don't get this hold of this thing. Father, thank you in the name of Jesus for your mercies. Thank you, Lord, for your grace. Thank you, Father, for this beautiful convention of the Redeemed Christian Church of God. Thank you, Lord, for your servants, your children. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for how you started the work there and how you've moved it from glory to glory over the years. And Jesus, we do ask you, Lord, that you breathe upon us. You, Lord, you will confine me only to what you once said, that your bidding be done. I pray, Lord, for heart transformation, heart transplants, God Almighty, Lord, uh, with my listeners. I pray, Lord, in the name of Jesus, that, Lord, you take a hold of all of us, remold us into what you want us to be. Father, I pray that somebody's ministry today, Lord, that the arrowhead of his calling will become sharpened. Somebody, Lord, will become an effectual battle axe in your hands. I pray for an awakening. I pray, God Almighty, for a stirring of spirit of every man. I pray, pray all tests to come alive again. Knees that have gone feeble to go strong. I pray in the name of Jesus Christ, the Lord, men will begin to take strides beyond the normal. Thank you again and again, my Father. To you alone, we give praise and honor in Jesus' mighty name and amen. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Please wave at me. Let me know you can hear me well. Praise God. Hallelujah. Open your Bible with me very quickly. I um, want to thank all the pastors, the senior pastors, the ministers, all the parish pastors, is it uh, zonal pastors, area pastors, um, everyone within the leadership structure of this great, great commission called the Redeemed Christian Church of God. We want to thank God for your lives and your sacrifices. Thank you, Lord, for cooperating with your leaders. Thank you for making the work easy. The Lord will help your life. In the name of Jesus, you will not struggle. In Jesus' mighty name, I pray for you uh, that today, after today, a spirit of ease will come upon your concern. Your ministry will, will become easier in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. As, as you cooperate with your leaders, the more, the Lord will lift up your hands beyond how you can lift it. In Jesus' mighty name. Hallelujah. Open your Bible with me to the book of 2 Timothy and chapter number 4. I've been asked to speak on the topic, what is your score? What is your score? Um, that is a very pregnant, um, a very, very pregnant topic. I had to call man of God and ask him, okay, what is the Lord saying? So um, he, he gave me um, a direction as to God's heartbeat on the matter. Hallelujah. And I will, we will be opening quite some scriptures. Some I will not be able to open. And probably I might just quote them. You write them down. Uh, but I need you to go back, please, if it's possible. I hope this is recorded. 
um, go back and listen to it a second time, if possible, a third time, if you can. It's not possible you will um, absorb and ingest everything I'm saying at the first listening. Amen. Second Timothy and chapter number four, we'll read from verse number six to eight. Second Timothy and four, verse six to eight. Let me tell you what a bit about Second Timothy. Second Timothy is the last epistle written by Paul. Paul wrote this epistle uh, while he was in prison. He was, he, was, he was in prison twice. The first time was in Rome. He knew he was going to be released. And that's why you see some of his epistles, he will write that um, uh, I will be with you shortly, or I hope to see you shortly. But this was the one, the second imprisonment. The first imprisonment was incited by the, uh, by the, by the Jews who went and told the lie. Same thing they said about Jesus. They went reporting him to the Roman authority, he was arrested. He was tried, he stood before Caesar, defended himself, was released. This second one was arrested by the Romans themselves. A particular Caesar called Nero, um, who loves building, decided to burn Rome. Um, Rome was burned um, in AD 70. Stay with me, I'm just giving you a background. Rome was burned in AD 70, and Nero, because he wanted to embark on the construction project, he loves building, he loves seeing structures, he was crazy about structures. So he wanted to rebuild Rome to his own taste. So he set some part of Rome on fire, the famous um, Roman fire, that should be, sorry, AD 64. And the Bible records, ladies and gentlemen, that um, the Christians were being blamed for this. Christians were blamed for it because the Christians, as are then in the Roman Empire, were seen as a people that were rebellious. They were serving a king different from the king himself, Caesar. Caesar was meant to be the ultimate. And anyone that serves another king besides Caesar was being seen as an enemy of the empire. And the Christians were loyal. Their loyalty was first of all to Jesus Christ, who was their king, then to other authorities. And that didn't go well with the Romans. So when the fire was, was um, when Rome was engulfed in fire, uh, the natural people to blame for it were the Christians. And Paul was one of the renowned leaders, known leaders, don't forget they had been before Caesar the first time, that were um, blamed for all, all this, and they arrested him again. And this time he knew it was not coming out. So it, the Second Timothy is a very, very emotional book, if you have to read it again. The very last epistle he wrote, he, was, he, he knew it was not coming out, so he was giving his final words. And these were the things he said about himself. He knew he was going to die, and he knew he was going to be beheaded. Um, as a Roman citizen, he could not be crucified. Other disciples, Peter was crucified according to Bible history. But because Paul was a Roman citizen and Roman citizens could not be subjected to crucifixion, he was beheaded according to um, church history. So this was a very emotional thing. He wrote a lot more about himself. He took time to admonish his son, his beloved son, Timothy. And I pray in the name of Jesus that before you see Jesus, there will be one person that you are going to raise. That when you are, you are, God gives you the privilege to write a letter, a departure letter, there will be somebody that you have influenced their life, that has known God, that is serving God, that can pick up the mantle from where you stop to continue if the Lord tarries. And that person will be, if you have not had one from today, God will steer you up and send someone to you for you to mentor for him in Jesus' mighty name. And amen. And so this was an emotional letter. It was a departure letter. And so Paul wrote here in um, 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 6, I needed to give you the history of this letter. So you know it was the last words of a dying man. The last words of a dying man. He knew his own tenor in this physical body was about to end. Okay, his existence on this side of his, um, his, um, his life on this side of existence was about to terminate. So it's time for him to transition to something better. So he wrote here, chapter number four, second Timothy verse number six to verse number eight. For I am ready. Brethren, read this. I read from the New King James Version of Scripture. For I am ready, being poured out as a drink offering. A drink, a drink offering, let me explain before we keep reading. A drink offering for some of us that have some um, background in Africa. You know that um, our fathers used to pour libations to the gods or something. Um, they used to do a drink offering. So what they do is they pour some brandy or gin or wine in a cup and they pour it to the ground while saying some things. 
Okay, now it also happens everywhere. I think uh, ev everywhere globally, there is always a drink offering that you pour it to the ground. Drink offerings cannot be taken back. Once it is poured to the ground, it is absorbed. So he's saying, I have surrendered my life. My life had been such that every, uh, every part of me, I gave it not expecting anything in return. Please understand that. A drink offering is a, an offering that is poured without an expectation of a return. Take, take note of that, please. So he said, I, have, I am being poured out as a drink offering and the time of my departure is at hand. In other words, I am about to die. I have fought a good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Finally, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day. And not to me only, but to you, but to you, but to you, but to me, but to all of us in Jesus' name. But also to all who have loved his appearing. May the Lord bless the reading of his holy words. Not, to, not just to me, Paul said. Now please mark the words of this dying man. Final words. He says, I have fought a good fight. I've been pouring out my life as a drink offering. Serving the Lord without an expectation of a return. Serving the Lord without an expectation of a reward. However, here comes the summary of my reward. Please take note of scripture, brethren. Here comes the summary of my reward. In the fact that I'm about to see Jesus. And that he is going to reward me for everything I've ever done in this flesh. And that he is going to stand, I'm down to stand before him as the righteous judge. Take note of that. So four things here. Number one is the fact that while he was living, he was pouring out his life as a drink offering. Number two is the fact that he fought a good fight. Number three, he has kept his faith. And number four, he has now is now going to face the righteous judge. Now, please, Jesus here is not saying, he didn't say, I'm going to face my savior. He says, I'm going to face the righteous judge. Now, that changes the dynamics of this whole thing. A lot of us know the Lord as a father. We call him father a lot. And brethren, that is what he is to us. Father, hallelujah. Our father who art in heaven. That is who he is. Brethren, is your father. Bible says, and my heavenly father shall give unto you whatever you ask. Hallelujah. John 14, it says, Bible says, and whatever you ask in my name, the father will give it unto you. So he is father to us. Then we call him Lord, ladies and gentlemen. Lord simply means he is the king of this kingdom king of our kingdom, and we are his subject. But brethren, there is a dimension of God we don't talk about very often, and that's the fact that he is a judge. Not just a judge, he is a righteous judge. That introduces some legal precedence into this whole thing. In other words, ladies and gentlemen, at the end of your life, we are going to face a court. And that court, ladies and gentlemen, is not a court that has to do with plaintiff or defendant. It's only about, I pray for you in the name of Jesus, yours will be about a God standing before you and asking you to give account of the work you have done. There are going to be two types of judgment. There is a great white throne judgment and there's the judgment seat of Christ. He wasn't talking about the great white throne judgment. In, that, in Jesus' name, you will not go there. That one is for unbelievers who are condemned already. But this one is for the saints who have poured out their lives as a drink offering. Don't forget drink offering. I am giving it without expecting a return. You don't drink what has been poured on the floor. All right. Then it says at the end of the day, the whole story is all the reward that it seems as though I've missed out on earth. All the things people have looked at me and it's all as though life was not really happening for me on earth. And all the things that people have said about me, and they're all coming together. You see, each one they are saying, well, you're a fool. You're not doing this. You're not doing that. You don't have this. You don't have that, ladies and gentlemen. I'm not saying you should not have them. You will have them in Jesus' name. But ladies and gentlemen, we don't live for that, first of all. Paul said, I have lived my life, put it as a drink offering. Here comes my reward. I will stand before the judge, not before the master not before the Lord. Righteous judge. In other words, there is no partiality in that judgment. What you do is what you get. 
There is no partial. You're already going to be in heaven. Your, your name is already in the book of life. What you do is what you get. It's as simple as that. He had to put the word righteous. Jesus is the bottom of, and the, the, the evidence of righteousness, the totality of righteousness is Jesus. For him to be called righteous, judge, and gentlemen, is for you and I to understand the fact that this judge cannot be bribed. This judge, you see, you cannot, there's not, you, you, you can't prove anything. He knows all things. And so when he comes before you, with every detail that is with him, you are going to face him, you'll be dumbfounded, ladies and gentlemen. And there are two categories of work that he's going to judge. Number one, the one you did for yourself. Number two, the ones you did for him. Number three, and the ones you did for other people. Because a lot of us live for others. And ladies and gentlemen, the one we live do for other people are going to be divided into two categories. The one you did expecting a reward for yourself and the one you did because of God. Stay with me this morning. We are going a bit deeper. So here comes, we have laid a foundation this morning. Glory be to God. I feel like preaching this morning. We've laid a foundation. Now the foundation is saying, ladies and gentlemen, brethren, three things are very sure. Here, the fact that the person we are going to face is a judge, not father, not lord, not master, not friend, judge. At that point in time, Jesus, as it were, will wear a wig and will wear the ground. I'm just trying to give a picture, okay? And he will sit on whatever. There is no lawyer, no advocate there because he's the only advocate. Ladies and gentlemen, every advocacy that should have been done for you had been done on Calvary Street. All right, and he has been doing it while you were this on this earth. The moment you leave this body, ladies and gentlemen, he becomes the judge, he sits down, and the one who had been your advocate, a lawyer, representing you before the father against the devil all through your physical life, your life in this body, suddenly now takes the position of a judge, no longer an advocate. Stay with me. Let me make some six, five general statements we are going to look at this morning. Please write them down, bear them in your heart. Do not forget them. Number one, number one, some facts that is going to help you understand what we're talking about this morning. God does not measure our lives in days. Our lives are measured by purpose. God doesn't measure our life in a number of days. I need you to know that. God measures our existence by what? Purpose. Purpose is God's yardstick or unit of measurement as to the worth of your life. Let me explain this in a simple way. You know, a lot of times because we live in time and as far as we are concerned, time is what is most valuable to us because we live in time. God does not live in time. All right. And because he doesn't live in time, he cannot measure our life by time. He measures our lives by what he intended for that life to do for him that made him create that life. In other words, your purpose pre-existed you. God had something in mind. Even though your parents did not want you, God had something in mind that made you come. So there's no illegitimate child on earth. There could be illegitimate relationship that births the child, but there's no illegitimate child. The moment you are born, ladies and gentlemen, Purpose has already knocked in. And ladies and gentlemen, God measures your life by purpose. What did he create for you to do for him on earth? Period. Nothing else. As far as Jesus was concerned, John 18 verse 37. John 18 37, the Bible says, Jesus stood before Pilate and Pilate said, who are you really the king of the Jews that they are said? And because he felt he had power to release him. And Jesus said, to this end was I born. For this cause came I unto the world, that I should bear witness unto the truth. Jesus knew why he came. He knew that he came to bear witness to truth, ladies and gentlemen. Bible says in the book of Matthew chapter 1, it says in verse 21, and that you shall call his name Jesus, purpose, for he shall save his people from their sin. If you read the book of John chapter 1, from Bible says from verse 6, the Bible says, and there was a man sent by God whose name was John. Now, this man was not the Christ, but he came as a forerunner. And from verse number nine, they began to ask John and said, John, are you the Christ? Are you a prophet? Are you, who are you? Are you the one to come? And John said, don't mistake me for other things. I know my purpose. I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Let's straight the path of the Lord, make his way straight. That is my purpose, ladies and gentlemen. It's a terrible thing, ladies and gentlemen, 
to live your life doing someone else's job. At the end of the day, you'll have been so active, you get before God and your own account or your own record reads zero. Though you were busy, you were busy not doing what he created you to do. So we are, we are, it's a two-edged saw this morning. It's about number one, am I doing what I'm supposed to do? Then number two, am I doing it the best I can? Hallelujah. Stay with me still. Number two statement. Number two statement is the fact that the only relevance we have to this earth, in other words, the only relevance you have, what makes you legitimate on planet earth is, your, is you being in this body, this physical body. I take that again. <laughs> in other words, I'm saying to you, anything that does not have a physical body on earth is illegitimate. What makes you legitimate on earth is because you are still in this body. And that's why, while you are still in this body, salvation is possible. The moment you leave this body, which we call death, your spirit comes out of this body, salvation is no longer possible. What makes you legitimate? And that's why demon spirits are not legitimate on earth. Angels that God did not send to earth are not legitimate on earth. What makes you legitimate on earth is the fact that you are still in this body. In fact, the truth is this, the day we die, the day I die, and I leave this my body, physical death, I am no longer legitimate on earth. For it is appointed unto man wants to die. And after then, judgment. I'm not supposed to be here once I die. No, <laughs> I'm not supposed to be here. You go straight before the throne of my master and you face and you already, where you are gone and where you spend eternity is already sealed. So there is still hope, ladies and gentlemen. If God is still allowing you be in this body till now, it's because purpose is not finished. There's still something you're supposed to do. Or maybe he's giving you another opportunity. Purpose has not started. In other words, you have not started living life for him. You've been living for yourself, maybe, or you've been living for other things, or maybe living for the society, or maybe any other thing. But ladies and gentlemen, know this. What makes you legitimate? The moment you get out of this flesh, the moment you leave this body, you are no longer legitimate on earth. No longer legitimate on earth. Did you see in scripture, for the devil to have relevance on earth, don't forget Satan is a spirit, is an angel, is a fallen angel. For him to have relevance, to be able to talk to man, he had to borrow, borrow the body of a serpent. If you are not death, if you are not dust, you have no relevance on earth. For God created this place to be ruled and, do, and, and, and controlled by dust. So for him to steal what man had, he had to enter dust. Dust has to talk to dust. Hallelujah. And that's why we can cast out spirits. Spirits are illegitimate on earth. Demons are illegitimate in your home, in case you don't know. They don't have flesh. They don't have, but that's why they're always looking for a body to enter. For them to become legitimate on earth. If they don't find one long enough, they have to return to where they came from. That's why the Bible says you cast out a spirit, Mark, Mark chapter 12, cast out a spirit from a man. He goes into dry places, still looking around. He does not want to go back, looking for a house. Then he comes back to that same place to see if it's still open. Why? The moment he doesn't have a body within a period of time, he becomes illegitimate on earth. What, your, your existence in this body is what makes you legitimate. The moment my grandfather can never be legitimate on earth. He has died years ago. My grandmother can never be legitimate on earth. She had died years ago, ladies and gentlemen. I am the only one legitimate on earth. And my legitimacy on earth is to the extent to which I am still in this body. The moment I am no longer in this body, I become illegitimate. Number three. Number three. Your stay in this body is timed. <laughs> your stay. How long you be in this body is timed. So for those of you that think you look young forever, check the mirror. You are deceiving yourself. You are no longer as young as you used to look. From And let's, well, let me tell you this. The, the, the clock of your life started kicking in from the moment, the day you were born. The day you were born, the countdown began. We look at young little children and we say, oh, they have a long way to go. Brethren, that's not even in our hands because we don't know God's purpose for them. If we knew God's purpose for John the Baptist, we would have known that he would die young. If we knew, if we knew God's purpose for the, Jesus, we would have known that Jesus needed to die young too. 
But ladies and gentlemen, God, as far as their God is concerned, they didn't die young. They were of full age. Full what? Full purpose, ladies and gentlemen. Paul also was not an old man when he died. But when he told us, I have finished my course, there is nothing else. See, as long as you're on this earth, it's because there's still something to do. The day you finish work, God will take you home. No prayer stops that, my brother and sister. God will take you home. And I pray in the name of Jesus Christ that you will not overstay your time here. Because anytime you overstay purpose, like Hezekiah, um, 15 more years, catastrophe happens. Catastrophe happens. So I'm sure from that time, it can't happen anymore, ladies and gentlemen. Catastrophe. And I pray for myself. I tell everyone, it's not about, see, the devil can't kill you once you are busy for God. Stay with me. This one, we're going somewhere. So your, own, your existence in this body is timed. It is time. The time started ticking and go. Your, it's like co, co, co. each one is going from the day you were born. From the day you were born, the whole clock started ticking. Amen. Therefore, which means your existence on earth is a race against time and death. Your existence on earth is a race against. I didn't say a race with. A race against because two of you are going contrary directions. Okay, while you are getting older, time is getting shorter. While while you are getting older, death is getting closer. Whether you like it or not, it is as simple as that. Well, even you see, even if you don't fulfill your purpose, there is a particular age that your body will shut down, and it has to go, whether you fulfill purpose or not. So our existence on earth. Is a race against time and, and death. Jesus said, John 9 verse 4, I must walk the walk of him who has called me while it is day. For the night comes when no man can walk again. A time will come, brother, when you can't walk again. <laughs> a time will come when you can't do some stuff again. So Solomon admonished us in the book of Ecclesiastes verse 27. He says, Serve the Lord in the days of your youth. When the evil days have not come, evil days will come. When your strength has not been abated, ladies and gentlemen, while you still have breath, there's some things you can do. The moment you no longer have breath, the Bible says, the living, the living shall praise you as I do this day. So our existence is timed and the countdown started from when you were born. Number four, number four. So which means, ladies and gentlemen, our whole life is meant to fulfill the purpose of God. Okay? And I pray for you in the name of Jesus Christ. Your life will satisfy God's will in Jesus' mighty name. Can I hear someone say loud amen with your hands raised? Hallelujah. I say your life will fulfill God's will and God's purpose in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, please, number four. Point number four is very critical. Here, I'm going to need your attention. You understand me so far? Can you give God a hand of wave and say hallelujah? Praise God. I can see your hands. Now, point number four, there are two kinds of God's will. There are two kinds of God's will. Number one is determined will. Number two is desired will. Number one is determined will. Number two is desired will. Hallelujah. Now, please, this is very critical. This is the core of this message. I lose you here. It's not likely you'll understand what we're going to say and how we're going to land. Number one is determined will. Number two is desired will. What is determined will? Determined will are God's own determination that cannot be influenced by your choices. Things that God had decided on that cannot be influenced by your choices. They are not subject to your choices. In other words, what you say, what you do, what you want to do. Your opinion is not needed in that, that regards. And I'm going to give you examples of them. Hallelujah. Glory. I'm going to give you examples of them. Now, Examples of determined will. 
Number one example of a determined will is your purpose, what he created you to do. <laughs> he did not call you to a conference to determine with you and say, oh, um, Mike, where you go, are you going to be a minister or you're going to be a footballer? He didn't, he didn't ask. He just decided, I want you. You're going to go to Belgium, leave your, your father's house in uh, Aron Dizogo and go to Belgium and sit down there and you are going to sit down there and raise people for me and nurture people for me. And I will make you an authority over that country, period. He was not around or alive to negotiate that and say, Lord, I mean, <laughs> I don't know about you. <laughs> I will have negotiated some things, but that is not up to you. So what God created you for uh, is not up to you. It is not up to you. Number two, determined will. The family you are born into. The family you are born into. I don't know about you. If I were, God gave me an opportunity to be to choose the family I'll be born into before coming to the earth, I won't, I, I, I'll be born by the Queen of England so that I will get paid to do what my mother tells me to do. That's all the work I do. But I get salary because mom says, get up, I get up. Mom says, sit down, sit down, I get salary. Isn't that wonderful? And when is my birthday? The whole world will know. And car companies will struggle to give me cars because any car they give me goes global. Hallelujah. Glory. Isn't that a wonderful life? <laughs> the family you are born into. So which means, ladies and gentlemen, my brother, my sister, listen carefully. Your father, your destiny, the purpose of God in your life, if you have a father that is an absentee father, or you have a father that is an unloving father, or a mother that is an unloving mother, your destiny and your purpose requires such a mother and such a father. In case you don't know. <laughs> so for you to now sit down and say you will, not, you will not be good to them because they were not good to you. You don't understand God. Oh no. Your destiny requires a father that will not show care. That will not show love. Your destiny requires a mother that will not be a friend to you. That will not, that will not even want to see you. Everything you met in your father's house was God's purpose for you. And if you have that revelation, ladies and gentlemen, you will even thank them for playing their role, their role of not being around for you. Number three example of determined will, stay with me, is your gender. Your gender. None of us said, God, make me a boy. <laughs> or Lord, make me a girl. <laughs> your gender is part of God's purpose. He predetermined it. He predetermined it, ladies and gentlemen. I was listening when Pastor Boma was leading us in prayers. And ladies and gentlemen, your gender is predetermined by God. You cannot decide for God where if you are going to be a guy or a babe. It's not possible. The Lord himself is the one who determined it. And your gender fits into his purpose for you. So for all those who want to now change their sex from male to female, See, you change your body. Your destiny has not changed. Change your body. Your destiny has not changed. Your destiny is not, is not, is not in your body. Your body carries it out. <laughs> and in case you don't know, there's no gender in the, in the spirit. There's no male and female angel. There's no male and female spirit. All right? The, the Bible says Jesus was told and asked by the Sadducees and said, Sir, um, a, a, a man, a woman had a husband. Her husband died. Uh, according to the law of Moses, she remarried. Eventually, she married the seventh one. When they get to heaven, they were, they were scorning Jesus. When they get to heaven, which one of them will be a husband? Jesus laughed at them and said, foolish people. You don't understand nothing. <laughs> Literally, he said, foolish people. You don't understand anything. He said, you don't know that when we get to heaven, we are like the angels. Never marrying nor giving in marriage. In other words, there's no he or she. That's why... Any, any ministry that does not allow women, okay, minister, it's from the pit of hell. In case you don't know, anointing is not in your body, it's in your spirit. And your spirit has no gender. Anointing is not in your body. You feel it in your body, it flows through your body, but the anointing is in your spirit. Hallelujah. Number, how many have I given you now? Five examples of determined will. How many have I given you? Somebody show me a sign. 
three. Okay, let's stop there because of time. Now, let me go to what you call desired will. Desired will. Desired will. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. The Bible says, um, in the book of Peter, it says, not willing that any should perish. He said, but that God is long-suffering towards us. Not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. What is God's will? He wills that everybody will come to repentance. Will everybody come to repentance? No. So it is not all of God's will that stands. God is not in control all the time. He's only in control of determined will. But when it comes to desired will, he can only control areas that have been committed into his control. You do not give it to him, he's not the one in charge. He's not the one in charge, ladies and gentlemen. I hear a lot of people say God is controlled all the time. Oh, no. He's in control over determined will. And also is in control. <laughs> excuse me. Is in control over desired will that have been handed over to him. If you don't surrender your life to him, Jesus won't have it. Even now, listen carefully. Let me explain this to you. I love this part. And a lot of people miss it here. We always feel that God will withstand. God does not enter spaces he has not been called into. See, the fact that God, the fact that you are saved, uh, the fact that you are God's child does not mean God trusts you. There's a difference between relationship and trust. God has a relationship with you does not mean he trusts you. Okay, trust is not given. Jesus did not die for God to trust you. He died for God to save you and have a relationship with you. The trust that you want to have with God has to be built over time by you. You must show yourself faithful. So grace brings you into a relationship with God, but grace does not determine how far you go in that relationship with God. That one is in your hands. What is God's will? God's will is he desires that all of us will be close to him. Will we all be close to him? No. God's will is that all his children will obey him. We will all obey him? No. He says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, I think that should be verse 13 or 18. He says, he says, in all things, give thanks. For this is the will of God concerning you. Do we all give thanks in all things? No. Is that the will of God? No. Does the will of God stand all the time? No. There's a reason why the Bible says, commit your ways unto the Lord. Trust also in him. You will bring it to pass. The way you have not committed into God's hand is in your own control. You don't commit your finances to his hands. It's in your control. You don't commit your wife into... Listen carefully. You don't commit your wife into God's hand. Whenever men come and complain about their wives to me, I ask them the first question. How often do you pray for her? Anything you have not committed into God's hand can be damaged. And guess what? What Satan cannot destroy, he will distract. If he cannot destruct, destroy you, he will use everything to distract you. And if you do not bring everything around you under God's care and protection, they will become agents of distraction. She is not a witch, sir. She is not the one standing against your ministry. You are the one that is not praying. You have not committed her into God's hand. But you say she's a child of God. Yes, she's a child of God married to a minister of God that demons are interested in. And if you do not commit her into God's hand, she become an agent of anything. Same with him also. Commit your job into God's hand. Commit anything you have not handed off, God cannot hand on. I say that again. Anything you have not handed off, God cannot hand on. In other words, God is not in control of what you are in control of. Hallelujah. Glory. Those are desired will. So what you do day after day, your choices, how you're going to spend your money, okay. how you spend your time, yeah. how you're going to, uh, what you're going to do today. I don't know the number, but I don't call what you want to do. Yeah, don't follow. Your desired will. You don't commit your days unto, unto God. It's in your hands. You don't commit your interview into God's, unto God's hand. It's in your hands. You don't commit your relationship to God's hands. It's in your hands. And brother, if it's in your hands, you're in trouble. I can assure you of that. The devil can deal with any man at any time. It is only Christ in us that is the hope of glory. 
It's only the name of Jesus he bows to, not your own name, ladies and gentlemen. When, when, when Peter was arrested, they asked them, in whose name do you do these things? He said, in the name of Christ Jesus. Ladies and gentlemen, if you do, you do not commit it into God's hand. Anytime you go, you are going in your own name. And in your own name, demons do not bow, they laugh. But at the name of Jesus, every knee bows. When you go in the name of Jesus, when you commit it into God's hand, sometimes it's a simple statement. Say, Lord, I take control. Holy Ghost, I hand it over into your hands. Take control. It could just be that simple statement. Do you know what you have done? You have surrendered it and you say, Lord, take it anywhere you want. At that moment, Jesus take control. You don't hand it over. The Lord looks at you and sits. So it is possible for a child of God to be afflicted. God will be present and he can do nothing. Let's go further. Now, let's get to the core of the matter. Please, well, I took time to explain that so that you'll understand where we're going. Let's explain some core of the matter. If God were to have an assessment sheet, this guy, Paul, that we read, he assessed himself. He said, brethren, I've checked my syllabus. I have finished my course. <laughs> Every subject I have covered. <laughs> I have written my exam. I'm all A+. Plus. I am ready. Well, some of my friends used to ask me years ago and said, PK, how come is it that you don't, you are, you are, you are, what drives you? What drives, when it comes to God, I have no hold back. If God wants to have me this second, he knows he can have me. If he wants to take me home this second, he can. There's, I don't, I'm not interested in anything. And they said, Please, what, what drives you? I told them, I said, it is a fear. <laughs> and that's the truth. For some reason, when I was a teenager, I had an experience that made me think, suddenly I became afraid when I was younger. It was a good fear, not the kind of, uh, call it awe, but it was still a fear. I had this fear that when I see Jesus, after I've died, and I was giving account of what he wanted me to do, I was floundering. I was, I was you know, when he says, okay, PK, what did you do about this? I couldn't, I was just, you know, when you, when you are floundering, uh, you are just stammering. And Lord Jesus, I, did, did, did. I wasn't saying serious things. It was just a picture in my mind. Since that day, I told myself, brethren, this walk, we are going to die in it together. No problem. Anywhere I want to take us, we'll go. If he says Afghanistan tomorrow, I'll be the first on the aircraft. Anywhere, anything he wants done, it will be done, ladies and gentlemen. I don't want to face Jesus and not be joyful and proud to say, Father, thank you for using me for this. Thank you for using me for this. How did you spend the time? Lord, this is what I did. I should have done better, but Lord, this is the best I need to do. I want to be able to speak to him because at that point, you can't lie. And brethren, that drives me. How will I do when I see him? How confident will I be? Will I, will I stand like Paul and say, brethren, I'm good to go. And brethren, it's hard. It's, it's a difficult thing. You can never know when you're good to go. Very few people get to the point where Paul got to. I'm serious. Very, very few. But one thing I know from that passage, if you continue to pour your heart out to God like a drink offering, when I mean drink offering, without expecting anything in return, when you begin to serve God as though you know it is a great honor, privilege given to you by God to serve him, your life changes. A lot of us, the way we handle God is like God is privileged to have you. <laughs> You've forgotten that even when you didn't come, everything was going well. When you showed up, things were still going well. See, nothing. the, the church of God is a living organism. He has his own life of his own. Eh? The Bible says, they told Jesus, they told Jesus' disciples, shut up, stop praising the master. Jesus looked at them and laughed. If only you know that even stones can come to church. Stones can play instruments. Stones can press the organ. Stones can play guitar. Stones can play drums. Stones can sing tenor. Stones can sing treble. Stones can sing auto. By the time he told them, if they keep quiet, these stones are going to raise their head. Brethren, I am privileged to serve Jesus. I am privileged to be called this child. I am privileged to be called this servant. I am privileged, brethren, a great honor. The moment you stop seeing it as an honor, you are gone. The moment you don't see your relationship with Jesus as a great honor, 
The moment you don't see your service to Jesus as a great honor, bros, sees true words, Satan has cornered you. Satan has cornered you. And I'm going to, so if we are going to access and look at, I sat down and I was meditating. If God was to have a scorecard, what would be the points on which he would score us? Only three I found in scripture. And I found those three because there are three things God wants, God's intention for man is. Uh, I don't know if you are following me so far. There are only three things that God's, God's intention are for us. Number one, these are, these are God's intention for man. And these three things are also Satan's, the, uh, the flip of it is what Satan desires for mankind. What is God's desire for man? Number one, no God. Number two, enjoy God. Number three, serve God. That is all, nothing else. Know God, enjoy God, serve God. So these are Satan's three, only three, Satan's three um, desire for you and for mankind generally. Number one, don't know God. Number two, if you know God, don't enjoy God. <laughs> Number three, if you know God, you're enjoying God, don't be available for God to use. Therefore, going by the following, if God were to have a scorecard, his desire will be what will be his scorecard. What then will be the three items in God's scorecard? Number one, God will ask you, did you accept me as Lord and Savior? Did you accept me as Lord and Savior? He didn't say, did you come to church? Or are you a worker or a pastor or a minister? Mm -mm. Did you accept Jesus as Lord and Savior? The Bible says, all we like sheep have gone astray, turned everyone to his own way. But the Lord has laid upon him the iniquity of us all. Let me explain this. God has forgiven the whole of human race. The entire human race, born and unborn, has already been forgiven by God. If he had not forgiven us, he would not hatch a plan for salvation. It is his forgiveness that made us, they made him hatch a plan, afflict himself and kill his son on our behalf. Every one of us are forgiven already. However, not everyone is redeemed yet. To be redeemed means you are accepting his forgiveness. But people don't want to accept his own forgiveness. They want to walk their forgiveness towards God. That's what you call religion. And that's why every other religion will say they understand God, they know God, but they don't want to accept the person of Jesus. Because it's all about rebellion. God created a solution. We would rather have our own solution. God created a way out. We would rather create our own way. It's all about rebellion, not sin, rebellion. But ladies and gentlemen, God is saying, number one question, have you accepted me as Lord and Savior? The Bible says, John 1, 11, he came unto his own, his own received him not, but to as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to those who believe on his name. Brethren, 1 John 5, 4, whosoever is born of God overcomes the world. This is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. Are you a child of God? Is your name written in the Lamb's book of life? If you have not yet saved, ladies and gentlemen, church won't help you. Ladies and gentlemen, church will not help you. There's nothing called church in heaven. There is the body of Christ. There's nothing called church. You need to turn your heart to Jesus. First thing, so if you fail at this level and you score zero, there's no need to go ahead. Because at that point in time, ladies and gentlemen, God has never had a relationship with you. God cannot score someone that did not receive him. First item on his assessment sheet, have you accepted me? Number two, let me not flood time. Number two, did you live for me? Now, a lot of people that have accepted Christ do not live for him. That's another problem. <laughs> this, is, this is where the rubber meets the road. <laughs> Living for him, ladies and gentlemen, entails three things. Number one, being obedient to him. Number two, growing in him. Number three, reflecting his life to the world. 
obedience, growth, and reflection. Brethren, obedience, Bible says, is better than sacrifice. There are three types of righteousness mentioned in scripture. I hope I'm not overloading you this morning. Three types of righteousness mentioned in scripture. Number one is what you call self-righteousness. Isaiah 56, the Bible says our righteousness is like filthy rag before God. Our own righteousness, self-righteousness, our own good. That's what religious does. Religion does. We want to do the right thing. We want to do the best thing, okay? Um, we feel it's good, moral. All right, that is self-righteousness. Bible says it's filthy rag. I am good. I am nice. I don't hurt people. I don't do that. Doesn't get you to heaven. And that's why, please, ladies and gentlemen, note this because there's a trend going on on earth now. People are trying to create what you call a social gospel, where they accept your Jesus because of your gifts. They accept your Jesus because you feed the poor. They accept your Jesus because you 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 give to charity. That is not the gospel. That is secondary to the gospel. It is in the gospel, but that is not the primary reason of the gospel. Primary reason of the gospel is salvation of soul. Every food you give man, they will need food again. But when I give you Jesus, I've given you life. I've given you existence. First of all, then I'll give you food. Bible says in John 6, Bible says after he had taught them, then he now gave them food, he fed the 5,000. After, after he had taught them, ladies and gentlemen, our job is to go to the nations, preach the gospel. Okay, we can go with rights, go with other things, but because we want to preach the gospel. All right, so don't, don't come to, don't bring the gospel to, don't turn the gospel to a social gospel. The gospel is the gospel of Christ Jesus. It's as simple. God um, judged men and in Christ Jesus, Jesus had paid the price and God has accepted his price and anyone who comes in his name is totally made perfect. Hallelujah. It is important, ladies and gentlemen, that we live in obedience. Number two type of obedience is what you call imputed obedience. Imputed obedience. Number two type. The Bible says, 2 Corinthians 5, 21. 2 Corinthians 5, 21. He that knew not sin was made sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God by him. Ladies and gentlemen, you and I have become righteous because of Jesus. The righteousness he that he is, is what we are in Christ Jesus. Hallelujah. When we accept him. But there's another one that people don't talk about very, very often. And I'm going to read a passage just to help you understand it. There's another one. Lo loads of folks don't like talking about chapter first Timothy chapter 6 verse 11 first Timothy 6 11 now talks about the third kind of righteousness the third kind of righteousness is a derivative of the second one. Second one says imputed the one God gave us we are righteous because of what Jesus did uh, however Bible says that the righteousness that Jesus gave us puts upon us a responsibility to live in the nature of that righteousness. It is called practice righteousness. Practice righteousness. Where I follow the nature. Because my nature has changed. I am no longer a sinner. I am now a righteous man. And the Bible says, he that is born of God does not commit sin. Okay? I will not say because I am under grace. And I'm, going for, I'm walking contrary to nature. You see, if I am a, a, I'm not a fish. And I'm probably, um, I am a lamb. And I jump into water. It does not make me a fish. But if I stay long enough underwater, I'm going to die. That is how a wrong nature is to you and I. So if we are lambs, ladies and gentlemen, we flock together. Hallelujah. We follow the nature of lambs. Hallelujah. Glory. It says in 2 Timothy 6, 11, But you, O man of God, flee, flee, flee. There is a practice righteousness that flees, ladies and gentlemen. But ladies and gentlemen, something is even better than flee. Because the truth is this, if you are busy for God, you cannot be active for the devil. If you are busy for God, you cannot be active for the devil. So if you are pursuing righteousness, it simply means you are walking away from unrighteousness. So get yourself busy pursuing righteousness. Paul was saying here, pursue, pursue righteousness. That is a dimension, which is, well, <laughs> let me stop there because of time. My time is fast, fast, fast going. Now, we understand that, ladies and gentlemen. Another thing God is going to ask you is, did you live for me? Now, please, God is not judging us this morning. They're just questions. We are evaluating ourselves. Second Corinthians 13.5. Bible says, examine yourself. 
whether you be in faith. You know yourself, whether you be reprobate. So what we're simply doing now is simply an examination. And do you know why we're doing an examination? It's because we still have our life in this body. And don't forget, as far as we have our life in this body, our time has not expired. There are still some things we, are, we, are, we want to do. There are still some things we can do for God. Open your Bible with me to the book of Luke and chapter number 16. Luke 16, we're going to read verse number 19. Um, and to, well, you know the story. Maybe I, for the sake of time, I can't read the whole thing. I'll just give you a synopsis. Luke 16, 19 to 31. 19 to 31. You see there the story of Lazarus and the rich man. Second question, don't forget, first question, only three, three items on Jesus, on God's scorecard, assessment card. Number one, did you accept me? Are you born again? Number two, if you are born again, did you live for me? Because the truth is this, that area is God's desired will. All the three of them, there is desired will, there are not his determined will. God will never force anyone to be saved. God will never force anyone to live for him. God will never force anyone to do the third one. I will mention it very soon. You know the story. The Bible talks about a rich man who lived sumptuously every day. And there was another man who was poor and his name was Lazarus. Now, this parable is very, very unique. Two things about this parable. It is the only parable Jesus spoke in the scripture that had a proper name for one of the characters. God, Jesus will really say there was a certain man and there was a certain this and a certain place, but he never mentioned a proper name. This is the only one. Jesus gave a proper name to one of the characters. And you notice that he didn't give the proper name to the rich man. He gave the proper name to the poor man. The poor man's name is Lazarus. Lazi, I call it in US. Lazarus. Now, Lazarus simply means the Lord is my help. The Lord is my help. That's the meaning of Lazarus. So it simply means... Jesus is telling us here, two things you need to understand this. Now, if you look at the life of these two people, what did the rich man do that made him deserve hell? Bible says all he did was he enjoyed his life every day. That was all he did. But if you read further towards the end, if you go and meditate on this parable very deep, towards the end, you notice that he was talking to Father Abraham. He knew Father Abraham and he was talking to Father Abraham. And Father Abraham answered him and called him son. He didn't call him one man. Son, 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 son. Which means, ladies and gentlemen, some sons can find their, themselves in situations and places they shouldn't because they are refusing to live for Christ. The only crime, people still feel that the crime he did here was that um, he saw a poor man and he did not give him food. That is social gospel. That's not the gospel of Jesus. Nobody goes to hell for not giving somebody food. <laughs> All right? That is social gospel. You don't go to hell for not giving somebody food. You go to hell if you don't accept Jesus as Lord and Savior. And you go to hell, ladies and gentlemen, if you live sumptuously every day. It is not a guarantee, but it is a danger. All the guy live was live sumptuously every day. Let me tell you what it means. He's not talking about a physically rich man. Neither is he talking about a physically poor man. Open your Bible to the book of Matthew. Matthew and chapter number five. Let me show you the meaning of poor and rich. Matthew chapter number five, verse number three. Blessed are the poor in spirit. There is a poor in spirit and there is a rich in spirit. There is a poor in spirit and there is a rich in spirit. Open your Bible also with me. To the book of Isaiah, Isaiah, Isaiah chapter number, um, that should be chapter number 66, if I'm correct. Sorry, it's not 66. I, I will get the passage for you very, very soon. It's not 66. I think he just eluded my mind now. Um, and best. Anyway, all he's saying is there is a difference between being poor in spirit and being rich in spirit. The Bible, has, the passage, he just eluded me now. He says, but to this man will I look. He that is of a contrite heart and it's of, that is poor in spirit. That's the person God will look at. Poor in spirit simply means this. What it simply means is this. From the name, the Lord is my help. Poor in spirit means, do you look unto God for help, even for the things you can do? 
In other words, are you living for God? Are you living for God simply means are your motives to exalt the name of Jesus and self is out of it or everything you do, you do for self? That is what it means to live for God. It's not about the activity. First of all, it's about the motive. Motive. Am I doing it that God will be glorified? Am I, am I, some of us pray so that pastor can hear us. So <laughs> you are still living at that level after 12 years. There are still some things you do so that pastor can see you, brethren. You are, you are, you are very rich in spirit. Rich in spirit, ladies and gentlemen, don't forget in the book of First Corinthians, he says that every man's work will be tried in fire. Okay? If it is, if it is burnable, it will be consumed by fire. If it is not, it will be refined by fire. The one that will be consumed are simply the ones that are done out of a wrong motive. Why do you give? Why do you give? Why do we have to know how much you gave? So that we can respect you in church or what? Or so that we don't talk to you anyhow. Why, why, why do you do some things? Do you know even as a pastor, you can show off God's power so that the attention will come to yourself? So that people will look at you and know that you're a man of God. How stupid. If God decides not to show up at that time, you'll be, you'll be a laughing scum, but this message just shows up. Motive, ladies and gentlemen, is the first essence of living for God. God searches the heart. Why are you asking for the house? God wants to give us houses. Why are you asking for the car? He wants to give us cars. Why are you asking for the anointing? He wants to give us anointing. Why are you asking for to be a millionaire? He wants to make us millionaires. Why are you asking to be great? He wants to make us great. One of my fathers was discussing with me someday, or rather I heard in one of his messages. He said, he was asking the Lord, I said, Lord, you promise that you are going to give the riches of the Gentiles to your children. How come we pray, 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 pray. Nothing's really happening. And he said, the Lord told him, not me, him. He said, the Lord told him that if I collect it from the unbelievers and give it to my children, most of my children, the same thing unbelievers spend on is what they will spend it on. So why should I collect it from them? All believers have 10,000 euros. They use 7,000 euros to buy Gucci bag. Christian, you have 10,000 euros. You use 7,000 euros to buy Valentino bag. The same disease. Why should I collect that? They work for their own. You didn't work for your own. Let them have it because there's also a law of labor. But if God can trust your priorities, write it down. If God can trust your priorities, you make you great. Your power trees are not trustworthy. The little you have now, you are, you are contesting tithes and offering with God. <laughs> with the little you have. You give attention to your needs before the needs of God. If God can trust your priorities, a lot of people come around and say, ask me questions. I say, how, how do you do it? I said, the day I discovered Anybody God can trust their priorities, he will trust greatness into their hands. If God can trust your priorities, he will make you great. The problem, ladies and gentlemen, our power, do you know some of us, we just want to know that, we want people to know we have arrived. Especially those people that didn't believe in you. Huh? That is called carnality. Because the truth is this, if God now tells you to go and take part of his resources with you and go and bless those people that didn't believe in you, you will struggle with it. Nobody is here. See, even you yourself, you were somebody's problem at a time. Brethren, open up to God. Are we living for him? What comes naturally to mind when money hits our hand? What comes naturally to mind, ladies and gentlemen, when anointing or they give you an office, huh? they give you an office and suddenly you changed. 
And some of us are working for that office. Do you really want it? In fact, because your name was removed from the last deacons and deacons or uh, deaconesses and pastor and assistant pastors list, you are no longer talking to a pastor. If they make you a pastor yet, you will be a witch doctor. You are not ready for this. God does not give us what, what in that case, you, service is not what you want. Service is what you volunteer for. What he makes of you is not is your business. What he makes of you should not be your business. Just volunteer for service. I didn't know I was going to be a preacher. All I do is just prayer band. I'm in the prayer band praying. I go for evangelism. I play instruments on Sunday and I was enjoying my life. And brethren, probably I was even more productive. So one day they came and said, they are making me a minister. I ran away from church. Three months, they didn't see me. But now, you, you're doing everything to make sure that you enter into leadership. Brethren, small wonder, we're having folks in church, all you do is curse your members. How are they going to grow? How can the people you curse? Because, and it's not your fault, it's the fault of the people who put you there. And brethren, it is beyond this. Nobody stands before God as minister or pastor. You are, you are your name. The summary of your life is not even in your father's name. Summary of your life is your own first name. What are you going to do? Elijah, we don't know the name of his father. Elisha, all, everybody first name. Jesus, Peter, all of them first names. The summary of your life boils down to your first name. Your children will take your last name. They will not take your first name. Your first name is the one that is your own asset. What are you going to make of it? What will Piki Olawale be remembered for? Because there are different versions of Olawale. There are different vulnerables. There will always be different vulnerables. What is Mike going to be remembered for? First Corinthians 9 27. First Corinthians 9 27. Let's read it together. Second thing on Coca, did you live for me? First Corinthians 9 27. Glory be to God. Can somebody give the Lord a wave offering? Your life is moving to another dimension. You are going to be great, brethren. All those hands I see waving are great hands. Brethren, the devil do not want you to be great. You will be great. He doesn't want you to deal with him. Do you know why he's afraid of you? Uh, see, Kai, do you know, sir, that only Christians are the ones that the devil has no choice than obey on earth? Every other person is the oppressor. We are the only ones that are his oppressor. And that's why he doesn't want us to come to the understanding of who we are. We are children of the Most High God. We do not have control of our own life. Our life is in the hands of our Savior. He can do with us as he pleases, ladies and gentlemen. As long as he does that, the devil knows he is lost already. First Corinthians chapter 9, verse 27. This is what Paul said. Bible says, but I discipline myself. What does it mean to live for God? Discipline yourself. Self-discipline is lacking. We don't talk about it anymore. Self-discipline. I want you to notice, ladies and gentlemen, especially our sisters and a lot of brothers too. You sit down before TV. You can watch part one, part two, part four. But ladies and gentlemen, you have no part one, part two of prayers. After, in fact, you go halfway in prayers, you stop, you don't finish part one. But you can't tell you finish, you finish praying now. The next 20 minutes you go back and the next 10 minutes you go back and the next 10 minutes. But you can sit down. Part one, you finish uh, of a movie. Go and take your um, coffee and your tea. Sit down, watch part two. It's not a problem, ladies and gentlemen. He says, I discipline myself. That is what my, my natural self wants, but I don't have to give it all the time. I have to train myself, discipline myself. I cannot eat. It's not everything I can eat. Sometimes I'm not even fasting. I'll just tell food, just to prove to myself I have control over it. I can tell food no anytime I want. Sometimes tell sleep. Let sleep know who is in charge. So I want to sleep. I feel like sleeping, but I don't, I don't, you are not going to sleep today. You are going to pray. Do whatever it takes. self support said, I discipline myself. That's why small wonder this guy was saying, I'm about to go, man. I'm glad I'm leaving. 
I discipline my body and bring it into subjection. Lest when I have preached to others, I myself should be disqualified. In the name of Jesus, I see people that will be qualified before God here to this morning. I see people that the Lord will say, welcome home. None of us will be disqualified in Jesus' name. Come and lift your hands and shout hallelujah. Finally, number three. What is the third thing on God's scorecard? I'm going to stop here. What's the last thing on God's scorecard? Did you work for me? Being holy is not okay. In fact, the reason why you are holy and righteous in Christ Jesus is so that you can be useful. First Peter chapter 2 verse 9. Bible says you are a chosen generation, royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, called to show forth the praises of him. Not called to have fun in church. Not called, ladies and gentlemen, to do celebration party. Not called so that you'll be free from witches and cultists. No, called to show forth the praise of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Isaiah 43, 21. Isaiah 43, 21. This will have I formed for myself. They shall show forth my praise. God called you to show forth my, his praise. 8 verse number 9. He says in the book of Isaiah. He says, I and the children that the Lord has given unto me. We are for signs and we are for wonders. You are for signs and you are for wonders. God called every one of us to service. It's not about pastor. Everyone that's born again is called to service. Let's wrap this home and read the book of Luke and chapter number, Luke and chapter number 9. Did you work for me? If you did, did you work with all your heart? Or were you working to get attention to yourself? Luke chapter number nine. I will have to read this one, verse 57. And I'll read verse number six to 62. Luke 9, 57 to 62. Now it happened as they journeyed on the road. That someone said to him, Lord, I will follow you wherever you go. <laughs> and Jesus said to him, foxes have holes, birds, and birds of the air have nests. But the son of man has nowhere to lay his head. Then he said to another, follow me. But he said, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. Jesus said to him, let the dead bury their dead. But you, go and preach the kingdom of God. 61, and another said to him, Lord, <laughs> I will follow you. But let me first go and bid them farewell who are at my house. But Jesus said to him, no one, I haven't put his hand on the plow. No one. Haven't put his hand on the plow. And looking back, is fit for the kingdom of God. May the Lord bless the reading of his holy words. My dear brother Chris, it's nice to see you again. You're looking nice. Long time. Amen. Mike, is it the same one? All right then. Okay, come to pleasantries later. Jesus was walking around and you know a lot of people want to be associated with Jesus. Nobody hates failure. People love success. Especially miracles, where it is happening. That's why people leave one church to go to another because in that place there's just a lot of noise and it's happening and there are miracles and there are all sorts. And miracles are part of the gospel. Please, if, if you have not, you're not walking in miraculous, cry to God as a pastor. It is compulsory. It is necessary. The gospel of Jesus is confirmed. Paul said, I did not come to you in the enticing words of men's wisdom, but I came to you in the demonstration of the power of God. Okay? The gospel is preached and it is confirmed. It is miracles, signs, and wonders that confirms the preaching of the gospel. Hallelujah. And so this guy was enthusiastic. He said, Lord Jesus, I want to walk for you. And he came and said, and he said, Lord, I want to follow you. I'm, I want to be a preacher. I want to serve you. 
And Jesus said, foxes do not have holes. Birds, foxes have holes rather. Birds have their nests. We don't have a home. Right? This, our life is not a life of comfort. Guess what? If you, for you to know the motive of the guy, if he's really serious about following Jesus, if you say, Jesus, who wants house? Maybe I'm leaving my own house now. I, comfort, Jesus forget he will follow. Do you know he didn't say what again? He left, he ran away. Because two, three, I'm bringing out here three reasons why a lot of us are not making ourselves available for service. Number one is comfort. Comfort. It's easier to get people in poor, poor countries to serve God and work for him than get people in Western countries to do that. Do you know our problem? Or do you know our problem? Comfort. Comfort. You know, you've gotten to a level of life, a standard of life, that going to missions to go and walk with or going on the streets to go and minister to those junkies and people that they don't go, folks that are battling with the spirit of drunkenness and their only hope is the church of God. Okay, no therapy can cast out a demon. The only hope they have is the church of God. We feel they are too drunk. When they come to church, we give them a seat so that we don't, they don't disturb service. Brother, we need to go and rethink what this gospel is about. Those are people that when they come in, we bring them to the front seats. If they are stinking, that day is a stinking service. We are going to enjoy it together because that same brother will become a preacher. That same person that is stinking is going to become a preacher. It's about the gospel. We are the one, see, to show light simply means where everyone fails is where we succeed. Not we replicating what the government is doing. Government do not have solutions. They don't, they don't know what to do with a lot of things. People are locked down in addiction. The only the gospel of Jesus can set them free, but we don't want to associate with such people. Our evangelism is in interesting places. Places where people already have solutions. People are comfortable. Oh no, ladies and gentlemen. Another time you will see some people, if they were, you were ever told that they were, they were drunks and they were on the streets, you will, you will never believe it. That is what Jesus does. Preach to the rich. Preach to the middle class. Preach to the poor. Get everybody. But comfort. Say, brother, we're going to go on the streets. Then the next thing is, are we going to take a bus? You can't walk again. You, 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 you can't walk again. You come for night vigil. They said, let's pray. He said, uh, pastor, say, how long is going to be the prayer? He said, we start 10, we finish at 4. Uh, but, gee, but pastor, nobody will kill God though. This same you. This same you. Let me say it bluntly the way it is. Some of you, when you were going through the desert in Libya or Mauritania to get to where you are now, Jesus was the only name on your lips. Now you have entered comfort. You don't know him anymore. Some of you, when you went to the embassy, if they told you to pray for every day, 24 hours for four days, you did it. You got visa. Now, mm, 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 pastor, nobody will kill God. And brethren, comfort will never allow you to serve. Do you know what it does? Do you know what that tells me? It tells me you, you were looking unto Jesus for something, not for himself. Seek the Lord for who he is, not for what he does. The hands of Jesus is just a part of him. Those are his blessings. The heart of Jesus is the ultimate. Blessed is the man whom the Lord caused to run here. So when you, are, when you have gotten to the heart of my master, you know that even when you don't have, it's not because of the devil. It's because that's what the master wants for you. There are some people that do not ask, need to ask from God again. By virtue of the fact that they have, they have served their heart on a plate and told Jesus to take it away. They don't want to see it. Whatever he chooses to do with it, he can do with it. Comfort. The moment this guy heard that there's no accommodation, <laughs> no hostel, 
Say, Pastor, we preach. We have no place to lay our head. Say, ah, Jesus said, in the, we sleep in the garden or you know, get some money, we sleep. Anywhere the night meet us, we sleep. Say, ah, this is not for me. Relax. Somebody here, you are not hearkening to the God of Christ because you feel if you enter into ministry, you'll be poor. And there's a lot of responsibility on you. Haven't you noticed that you are still struggling? Number two. Another one came. This one also volunteered. Then Jesus met another one rather and said, you follow me. Brethren, brother, I don't know about you. Read through your Bible. This guy and the rich wrong ruler were the only two people, Jesus, besides the disciples, that Jesus said, follow me. It simply tells me that Jesus knew, obviously, because he's God, that one disciple was going to miss it. He didn't call them at the same time, called them at different times. He gave these two guys an opportunity probably to fill the seat of Judas after he had fallen. Because never did Jesus, beside these two, only the disciples that he called, he said, follow me. And they left everything to follow him. Jesus never told anybody, follow me. Only this guy and the rich young ruler. Jesus told this one in verse 59. He says, follow me. And Jesus said, and the guy said, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. Some of, some of you don't understand that passage. And Jesus said, let the lead bury their dead. And I will tell you the reason why a lot of us are not serving God. Let me tell you what it means to uh, go and bury your dad. In Jewish custom, I'm going to stop here. In Jewish custom, the first son, firstborn son, is the one that has the right of inheritance to everything that the father has. It's called the firstborn son relationship. Every other children are not in that relationship. Only the firstborn son is in that relationship. All right? And the, for him to um, step into his father's shoes and obtain the entire inheritance that the father has, he has to be the one that will bury his dad. He must be the one that is buried his dad. And guess what? The Jews bury their dead on the same day. They do not keep anybody in the mug. Same day, the person goes into the ground. And so um, this guy was simply saying, Jesus, let me, let my father die. Let me bury him first of all and obtain my inheritance, at least so that we have money for ministry. After that, we can hit the road. And Jesus said, let the dead bury their dead. This was what Jesus answered him. Other children who are not part of the firstborn relationship, in other words, second son, first daughter, and the rest of them, they are said to be dead to the firstborn relationship. Those ones are dead to the firstborn relationship. So when Jesus oh, said, let okay. the dead bury their dead, simply means let the other children who do not have a right to your father's inheritance, let them bury their father. And they will obviously take over the inheritance. You, come and preach the gospel. And the guy said, no, I'm not ready for that yet. Do you know, this reason was the reason why after Jacob cheated his brother Esau. Uh, you notice that Esau did not pursue him immediately until after Isaac was dead. Because if he pursued Jacob immediately and Isaac dies, before he gets back, somebody else buries Isaac. He doesn't have a right to his inheritance. But after Isaac died and Esau buried him, collected all the wealth. Did you notice that when Jacob was trying to give him something, he told them, I'm too blessed. I don't need it. Don't worry. He took everything. That's why he didn't run after, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen. Okay. So he was telling them, he said, what you call inheritance, what you call riches, you will still have them, but don't let them be the reason why you can't serve me. There's something you want to be. You want to be great. It's nice. I wanted to be the youngest professor of mathematical economics in Nigeria. And I was on my way. But that's not God's plan for my life. Don't let your ambition and desire stop you from service. Finally, number three. He said to them, he said to the other one, the one said, let me go and bid my family farewell. Some of you, it's because of your family that you're not following Jesus. What your father will say, your father will disown you, your mother will disown you. Your brothers will say you have betrayed the family. 
all sorts, especially if you are from a part of Africa, they will call family meeting and say, you have brought this repute to this family name and the rest of them. Or they, they spent good dollars to send you to good schools. You are now telling me you want to be a pastor when we are waiting for you to train your siblings. <laughs> uh, brethren, say dumb that. But brethren, above all this, God's kind of score is a continuous assessment. Someone say continuous assessment. The fact that you are still here, brethren, it is not finished. It's all a matter of making up your mind from today. What manner of person do you want to be? What manner of person do you want to be? It's all about from today. You remember that lady brought to Jesus in John, John 8? They said, ah, she was caught in adultery. After Jesus handled the matter and said, ma'am, you can go. And Jesus said, where are your accusers? I said, I, don't, I can't find them. He said, I do not condemn you. Only go from now. Brethren, your days are not numbered. Forget it. You are just starting life. God is just calling you into an office today. Do you know what is happening this morning? God is opening his door. His door of grace. And saying, if you really want, can you jump in? Let's take this to another level from today. That is all God is saying. See, don't let, don't, don't let your heart condemn you. That is not God. That is the devil. God is not here condemning any one of us. He's simply saying, brethren, let's take it from here. There is, while it is called today, while it is called today, tomorrow I might not know what will happen, but ladies and gentlemen, I am going to make up my mind, Lord, if, if I failed you in service before, Lord, you are about to see a different sun. It's about, it's about turning a new leaf. Don't let the devil see. The devil is the only one that sits in the past. Are you listening to me? I'm finished now. <laughs> I, I, you'll soon be, I'll soon be out of your face. The devil is the only one that specializes in the past. And do you know why he specializes in the past? It's because your past is dead. Your past is dead. Your past is dead. He says, this, this one thing I do, I forget the things that are behind me. Failures. I don't know anyone here or anyone on the surface of the earth that do not have at least one thing in their past that they don't regret. I have many, so many, ladies and gentlemen. But ladies and gentlemen, it is not my business. In fact, as far as God is concerned, they don't exist anymore. Stop visiting the grave. Yes, you didn't do well before now. Yes, if, if, if you are to even score yourself, besides God scoring you, you are, you are, you are a total failure. But that God is not interested in that. Yeah, that's why he's a God of the living, not a God of the dead. Your past is dead. Forget the things gone before. Press towards the price of the high calling in Christ Jesus. Look ahead, ladies and gentlemen. Today is the dawn of another day. You can be better than this. Let me explain this to you. Uh, there's nothing that God created that is absolute. I say that again. There's nothing God created that is absolute. Everything God created can be changed. It can be altered in some way. That's why There's a reason he did not create us with rock. He created us with mud so that changes can come. Otherwise, no, no, nobody can be saved. Otherwise, nobody can be healed. What do you call healing? It's just some chemical changes, some alterations, a poison getting out, and your defense is standing up. All those things working, ladies and gentlemen. Something new. You can become another man. You can become a different person from today, ladies and gentlemen. Let nobody tell you, ladies and gentlemen, that all God remembers of is what has happened before now. If you tell the Lord, Lord, and I'm sorry, Lord, let's start a new door. I'm, I'm drawing a new line today. Ladies and gentlemen, God is more than excited to say, well, let's roll and let's rock. It's time for great things. In the name of Jesus, may I challenge your heart, brethren. May I challenge your spirit, your inner person. Bible says, Paul said, I commend you to God, 2028, and unto the word of his grace, which is able to build you up, give you an inheritance among those that are sanctified. Let no man, ladies and gentlemen, despise your life, despise your youth. Ladies and gentlemen, it is the door. You can change everything God created. There's nothing that is absolute. It can be all. It can. It can be redefined. It can be altered. It can be redefined. God allows for flexibility. That's why He created it the way it is, so that we can change it. 
We can turn it around. We can move it around. We can look at the mango, look at the purple, crossbreed them and do something else. There's nothing that is absolute. You are not absolute. Don't say you, it is too late. You are not absolute. You can change. You can change. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Can we say a word of prayer together as we bring this to a close? Is it okay for you to just talk to God from what you have heard? You want to change today? Talk to Jesus. You want to turn a new leaf? Talk to Jesus. Are there areas you feel you're failing? Talk to Jesus. Come on. You can change. There is nothing that is absolute. Everything can be altered. Your change is possible. You can become another man, ladies and gentlemen. Bible says, and Saul was speaked, and he said, today you will leave me. You will meet two men at church at Sepulchre. They will greet you. After that, you meet three men going up to Bethel. They will give you bread. Then after then, you will come to the hill of God, which is the garrison of the Philistines. Bible says, and there you will meet a company of prophets. Bible says, prophesying, and suddenly the spirit of the Lord will come upon you, and you shall become another man, and you shall prophesy alongside. Brother, it shall be said of you after this one. Are you also among the prophets? Come on, talk to God. You can become another man. You can change. Hallelujah. Glory. Rainbow Sarie Paliata. Crende Cresci Cambre de Obreite. Ela. Ma para pareatia casa. Glory. Thank you. In Jesus' mighty name, we'll pray. Now, two things I will say, then I'll get out of your face. Number one, God is telling me to tell a lady. He says, your own job is to remember. In fact, you feel the reason why you don't have children yet is because of the many abortions you have done in time past. And even after you have heard that you have been reassured many times, you are still sitting there. God says you are better get out to yourself out of there, otherwise you will still be waiting. Because he has answered you a long time, but he, he, that's a desired will, you are the one in charge of that. And don't forget what the devil cannot destroy, he will distract. Hallelujah. There is another brother here. All the Lord says to tell you, stop stealing. Period. I know your name, I will not mention it. Stop stealing that is all he says to tell you you know yourself stop stealing because you still did it this past week again stop stealing you're an usher stop stealing that is all i will say that is all he says to tell you sir it is a sir i know your name stop stealing god bless you father we thank you for today we pray for grace upon this mission Grace upon everyone. Lord, you've given us a new leaf, a new leaf to life. Father, I pray for a stirring up of spirits, man. That the Holy Spirit, you keep allowing this word linger and ponder in our hearts in the name of Jesus. Father, I pray, God Almighty, the Lord, you pour fresh water upon all of us that will be cleansed and clean again, that the glory of the Lord will manifest. Raise us up as an army, oh God. Let the people go in the full anointing of your power and your grace. In the name of Jesus, that each community will begin to experience a move of your spirit through your children. Thank you for internal transformation. Thank you for making us vessels unto honor. Blessed be your name, oh God. In Jesus' mighty name, we'll pray and amen. God bless you.